that. Thank you. For the AAAE Professional Development Committee for hosting this session, as well as for the AAAE Identity and Inclusion Group, who has been working tirelessly to bring together really important sessions like this um, over the summer, as well as now extending in the fall. Um, outside of that, I would be remiss not to um, thank each and every single one of you for being here and contributing to this today. We are joined by five fantastic panelists from across the country and across the profession who are going to be here sharing their stories and sharing really valuable information with you. As you heard from the recording, we will be recording today's session and making it available for folks afterwards. And so hopefully this is something that you can share with your colleagues as well as others who aren't able to be here today. So with that, we are going to go ahead and get started. Just to give you an idea of what to expect for the format of this session, we'll spend about 40 minutes here together in uh, doing a panel, hearing from our five panelists, answering some questions that you all submitted uh, as you were registering for the session, some of the burning things that are on your mind. And then we'll have an opportunity to take those conversations into smaller breakout groups. We know as a very broad uh, profession, there are a lot of different ways that we can be applying these knowledge in each of our specific contexts. And while of course our panelists are gonna try to speak to the multiplicity of contexts that we have here in terms of both the sub-disciplines as well as the different ways that we can think about this in terms of our colleagues, our students, the young people that we're working with, um, we're of course not gonna be able to cover everything. And so the breakout rooms will be an opportunity to learn and share with your peers and discuss about what this information looks like in that specific context. So speaking of contextualizing, I think it's also really important to name that this is a really, really exciting thing to have this conversation as part of our AAAE organization. Um, and while this might be the first branded session to be out there about this topic, these conversations have been going on for decades. Um, we can trace research and unpublished theses and dissertations about LGBTQIA issues dating over 11 years now. So this has been an emerging and really important conversation for decades, and we're really excited to have it here. And while we have five fabulous panelists who are coming from a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different ideas about what it means to be an LGBTQIA person in agricultural education, ultimately, they're going to be speaking from their individual experiences because of course there isn't any sort of universal queer or trans experience in agricultural education. And while we do have folks who are going to be speaking from different intersections of identity, ultimately this panel largely represents mostly cis people and mostly white people. And so it's important as we're talking about these stories to understand that these are not the only truths that exist for what it's like to be LGBTQIA in agricultural education. And ultimately, we're gonna to leave today with um, not a lot of bows tied up. I, I don't want anyone to have the impression that we're gonna solve all the world's problems today or give you every piece of information that you need uh, to go and change your department tomorrow morning. Well, we like to think that we're gonna be planting some important seeds. Um, if ending these kind of systemic oppressions were easy, we would have done it already. Uh, so we welcome you into that complexity and that knowledge that we're not gonna solve everything today, but hopefully you'll be leaving with some ideas and a community to help solve these problems with you. So with that, I'm gonna start, stop talking, and I'm gonna invite the fabulous panelists that we have with us here today um, to do some introductions. So for those of you, and I, I'd like to start with Colby, if each of you could just introduce yourselves briefly, your name, your role, tied to agricultural education, if any, um, and any sort of aspects of identity or other contextualizing pieces that you might want to share with our audience today. Colby, go ahead. Might help to unmute my mic first. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Colby Gregg. Uh, I am uh, a PhD student in agricultural education at The Ohio State University. Um, I came here after teaching high school right outside of Chicago for four years, and I moved there uh, from Oklahoma where I did my undergrad at Oklahoma State, 
And um, I was, uh, I'm from the very rural town of Geronimo, Oklahoma. Um, and then aspects of my identity, I uh, very much identify as a gay man. Um, it, and that is primarily the, the, the role I'll be speaking from here today. Thanks, Colby. Matt. Yes, thank you, Kate. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Matt Hernandez. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I'm the graduate assistant for peer education in the Office of LGBTQIA Education and Engagement at Texas Tech University. I'm a master's student in higher education administration. Um, I don't necessarily have any ties to agricultural education, but I did grow up uh, in rural East Texas. Um, so I grew up around it, uh, but never got into it. Um, and uh, as for my identities, um, I would like to share that I, I'm a bisexual, biracial, uh, first-generation college student. Thanks, Matt. Erica. Good morning. I am Erica Tiemann, and I am the Director for Curriculum and Instruction at the Illinois State Board of Education. Uh, previously, I was the Principal Consultant over Ag Education for the State of Illinois, and before that, I was an Ag uh, Teacher Educator at the University of Illinois, and then even before that, I taught high school agriculture. Um, my, yes, yeah, so that's my ties to Ag Ed. Aspects of my identity I would like to share. Um, I identify as a queer femme woman. Um, I do quite a few things that are non-gender stereotypical. Uh, for instance, I'm a power lifter with state records in the state of Illinois um, and have always kind of walked that line um, while presenting as female. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Erica. Brandon. Hello, my name is Brandon. Um, I go by he, him, his pronouns. Um, I was an agricultural education student um, at the University of Minnesota, was really involved in FFA. Um, now I'm actually a graduate student in New York City studying psychology and religion, um, and I'm hoping to be a school psychologist, so that's kind of what I'm shooting for, so there's still a lot of relevancy to the education world for me, um, and I still have a lot of commitments to Ag Ed, too. Um, and then I... Uh, as far as identities go that I also subscribe to, um, I would just probably identify just as queer, um, and that's it. Um, both gender, sexually queer. Um, and then also, I mean, there's a lot of privileged identities that I hold, but I think particularly in a queer space, one that I would also just identify, it would just be my whiteness too, um, and how that shapes my queerness, I think. Um. Thanks, Brandon. And last and certainly not least, Jody. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as was said, my name is Jody Randall. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I serve as the director for the Office of LGBTQIA Education and Engagement at Texas Tech University, uh, which is a top 25 institution now on the Campus Pride Index for our LGBTQ inclusion work. Um, my ties to agriculture, so I grew up in Alabama, spent most of my life in Western Kentucky, working in Murray State University, another big ag school, before finding my way down to West Texas, which, uh, of course, our college of agricultural sciences and natural resources is a big part of our identity. So my, I come to this space as a trans woman uh, who has worked in higher ed nearly 20 years, uh, both in the classroom and on the administrator side. Thanks so much, Jody, and thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. It's really great to have you here today, and we're thankful for you sharing your stories. So. Before we get into some of those personal stories, Jody, you and I were talking a little bit as well as with the rest of the panel about what the, the landscape kind of really looks like in agricultural education as well as higher education. Um, so can you just give us a little bit of an, an impression from over your time working in higher education, what you see as kind of the general state of affairs and landscape right now? 
Yeah, talking about the landscape for doing uh, diversity and inclusion work, whether it's student facing or uh, our faculty and staff, as well as then bleeding over into the industry. Uh, it's an interesting time uh, to be doing this work, to say the least. Um, but the reality is that in higher education or academia specifically, we've been doing diversity and inclusion work for a long time. Uh, but unfortunately, what we have seen by looking at uh, a whole host of minoritized identities and populations is that the needle moves slowly. Uh, we, we have been uh, slow to see progress in higher ed as it relates to first generation individuals, uh, students of color, all these different minoritized identities. Um, and, and those are the ones that we even collect data on. Um, when you look at the LGBTQIA uh, community, oftentimes we don't even collect the data. So uh, to some extent, we've got a lot of work there to do. Um, so one of the ways in which I have in, in my time working in higher ed uh, come to, to see, we approach diversity and inclusion work oftentimes through um, programmatic efforts. Um, we love to throw programs at diversity initiatives. And what we miss in doing that, and I'm a big proponent, I lead an office that, that, that is a core tenant of ours, but we have not recognized that we really need to rethink some of the core practices uh, of our work in higher ed. And, and the reason I say that is Oftentimes, the structures we work in, whether it's in agriculture or a different area of the institution or the academy, is um, it was not designed in a time and place when the concerns and experiences of queer and trans individuals were included. Uh, it's not to say that they're unwilling to make those uh, changes or move in that direction, but they just simply were not designed uh, in that way. The last thing I would say um, is we really have to go back to this idea uh, that, that COVID-19 has taught us so well around being adaptable uh, and flexible, that when you're doing diversity and inclusion work, things change. Uh, and things change quickly as far as the needs of students, faculty, and staff with different identities. And you're, you're, um, none of us love to change. <laughs> none of us uh, are all about that. So that's really what I would suggest um, as we think about changing the way in which we do our work to make it more inclusive of queer and trans people. Um, those are really fantastic points and I uh, really resonated with a lot of what you're saying even looking at our own Journal of Agricultural Education we've never had a study published uh, that included LGBTQIA people either as a central focus of the study or even reporting those demographics like you were saying um, and I really appreciate that perspective uh, specifically thinking systemically now as we go to think a little bit about how these systems that are not agile, that were not designed with us in mind, shape our personal experiences. Um, so a lot of you all are here, I know, just to hear some of these personal stories and what it's really like to be a queer or a trans person in agricultural education. And just a note on language, as I'm saying queer, I'm referring to a broad umbrella of different marginalized sexual identities. And as, as I'm saying trans in the same way, I'm referring to a very large expansive umbrella of marginalized gender identities. And when I'm saying agricultural education, I'm also including the most broad possible umbrella and also our, our folks here like Matt and Jody who are perhaps not in agricultural education, but certainly a part of it in all these other interactions. So for all of my panelists, uh, I'll call on each of you by name. If you could just tell us, what is it like being an LGBTQIA person in agricultural education, whatever piece of agricultural education that might be? 
And what do you wish other people knew about what it's like being an LGBTQIA person in agricultural education? Um, Erica, if you could start us off. Yes, um, so I will start by sharing some of the positives that I've encountered recently as um, my official coming out, if you will, to the field was fairly recent after I was um, asked to be a part of a presentation to the National FFA Board. Um, I then decided me sharing that information about myself would possibly help teachers or students who were um, struggling and maybe feeling like they were the only one um, because I felt that way for a very long time. Um, so I did go ahead and share it within my state and then decided to um, build up my courage and share it on the Ag Ed Discussion Lab. Um, and that was a very, very interesting experience. The positives that came out of it were the countless personal messages, direct messages that I received from people who saw my post and saw the conversations that ensued. Um, there were lots of very positive comments from people who identify as LGBTQ plus who um, said, you know, I'm here and I'm, I'm glad there's people talking about this. That being said, there were a lot of people who messaged me and said, I, I can't come out. I can't be who I am. Um, if you're not aware, there are states that it's not, you can be fired for not being straight, uh, especially as a teacher. Um, so that was, that was a positive. And then there was also just a lot of um, uninformed, unexposed, um, misinformed, closed-minded comments that did come out as well. Um, but I think probably the biggest thing for me is there are a lot of assumptions that are made about people and who you are just based on appearances and things like that. And um, so that's, that's been my experience. You know, when I'm out in um, the general world, there are assumptions made about me if I have the tattoos and everything covered up. When I say I'm involved in agriculture, there's assumptions made from everything from my political orientation uh, to a lot of different things. And so I find the same thing to be true um, here in Ag Ed, that we do tend to make assumptions about people based on what we, what we see. Um, so that's, I, I'll yield my time to somebody else to share their experiences now. Thanks, Erica. Matt, can you share a little bit about your perspective? Yeah, I'd love to. And I, um, Erica kind of spoke to what I was wanting to talk about. Um, and that would be um, what agricultural education looks like from an outsider's perspective. Um, so when we think about um, just generally um, academia, we tend to think of the arts as something that's more uh, feminine and uh, the sciences is something that's been more masculinized over time. Um, and I sort of, I want to challenge everyone to think about why that is. Um, and for me, I think that those stereotypes, I kind of entered academia with an understanding that, you know, science is going to be that masculine sphere of academia and the arts are going to be um, the opposite. Um, but at a university of 50,000 people, um, the a professor in the College of Agricultural Sciences, who is Dr. David Dorfer, uh, who's on this call, received our Ally of the Year Award. Um, and a lot of people were surprised by that. Um, and so that really shows how much those stereotypes ring true um, among even university leadership um, who were like, oh, a professor in the College of Agriculture received um, an award for being recognized as an outstanding ally for the LGBT community in West Texas. Um, and so th that really shows that within agriculture, within the sciences, there is good work that is happening. Um, but for me, um, I took a class uh, in my undergraduate. I also went to Texas Tech for my undergrad um, in the agriculture building. Um, it was an art class. Um, and I went there about twice a week. Um, and every time I walked in, everyone had, they kind of looked the same. Um, they all appeared to be uh, white men, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but for people who hold different types of minoritized identities, so for, uh, we don't even have to talk about just gender and sexuality, we can talk about 
race, um, ability status. That might not seem as though it's a welcoming environment right off the bat. So with that being said, I think that when we are in those types of spheres, if you're in a sphere where it looks like uh, everyone kind of looks the same, I think that what a good practice would be would uh, sort of to be visible in showing that you are um, accepting and welcoming as opposed to just tolerant. Um, I think that we need to stop focusing on teaching tolerance and teaching more welcoming and accepting practices for people. I think that's how we bridge that gap um, and prevent the continuation of agricultural education looking the same. Um, so yeah, I think that is something that everyone can sort of sort of interrogate on their own um, and think of what that looks like at your institution, um, because obviously every institution is different. Um, but I think that this may be one of the common themes um, about this, uh, about what agricultural education might look like from an outsider's perspective. Thanks so much, Matt. Colby. Absolutely. So um, <clears throat> I have a couple of different uh, uh, perspectives in terms of um, uh, school-based agricultural education um, from, I've now been a part of three different universities and uh, three different states. So uh, my experiences have definitely changed uh, throughout all of those, all of those experiences. Um, a couple of kind of highlights that I want to uh, hit on is uh, number one, the kind of potential for society as a whole to uh, kind of focus in on one piece of someone's identity as their whole entire identity. Um, for example, at Oklahoma State, um, I was the entomology Colby, um, the bug Colby, um, until I came out my my third year, and then I was the gay Colby and it really showed to me how big of a difference that people responded to me as a person in their reference to my identity and my interests. And so um, I turned from being the entomology person to the, the gay person in the College of Ag. And, and that was a very kind of jarring transition for me, especially as a newly out um, person. Um, also, as a teacher, I was very thankful to uh, work in a school district that was very diverse uh, from the get-go and very large right outside of Chicago in a, a city called Naperville. Um, it, it was uh, barely majoritively white, um, so right at 52% white, and then the remainder of, uh, of the students were mostly of Asian descent. Um, and among that, we also saw very big supports for diversity for, for our school. And so recognizing that uh, there were um, um, gay straight alliances and, and all of those. But even among all of those supports, I was still um, subject to homophobia from my administration. And the reason I'm actually in grad school now is because in my final year of teaching, I was told that um, I needed to cut down on the gay um, and that I was talking about being gay far too much uh, for it to be a workplace. And when I was told that I was just kind of jarred because I did not, I didn't understand it because I didn't talk about being gay. Um, whenever I referenced my personal life, I was always using gender neutral pronouns. I was never talking about anything inappropriate, um, but because the students um, when they would ask me, and I would be honest, I wouldn't lie about my identity, um, that became an issue. And it was seen as inappropriate when my straight coworkers did not have the exact same uh, experiences. And so that kind of set me down a path of just failure uh, for my final year of teaching because all of my, uh, all of my teaching um, evaluations they didn't focus on what I did in the classroom. They focused on my sexuality and how I was being too gay in the workplace. And so uh, when I probed further to my administration, um, the only thing that really came forward was that another teacher who was in my classroom while I was teaching advanced floral design stopped by my uh, department chair's office to say that he could tone down the gay a little bit while teaching to a classroom of girls in advanced floral design. And so 
I don't need to go into the the issue of that's not me being gay. That's me teaching floral design and you assuming feminine things and feminine traits and feminine activities with my sexuality. Um, but it, it, that piece of my identity really became weaponized against me. Um, and so thankfully I'm now in higher ed um, and in graduate school and I feel very accepted and very welcome here at Ohio State. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of working into my research down the line of how can we identify um, these pieces of homophobia that teachers face and how can we help address them and how can we help um, support teachers and administration in the future. I'll jump off that. Um, I think what I would like to speak to a little bit is um, the fact that a lot of queer people, and this is my own personal experience that I'm sharing too, is our bodies know that we're queer before like we cognitively say, think, or whatever about it. And what I mean by that then is that like we walk through this world in a way that is queer um, because our bodies know it and it's still non-normative to the heteronormative way in which our world operates. Um, and so therefore we're kind of still experiencing this uh, like uh, maybe, maybe microaggression is appropriate to use in that way, but kind of like dissociated from it. Um, and so, yeah, I think like for me, that was a, a huge experience thinking about my like growing up experience. Cause I really only came out about two years ago publicly. Um, and I don't want to like idealize the coming out experience either necessarily. Um, but I really started struggling with like my, uh, sexuality probably like four years ago. But when I think about like my childhood and developmentally and the way that I've always experienced the world, it's always been, um, like it's always felt like it's rubbing up against something. Um, and I think that's relevant to ag ed specifically for young people who are in our agricultural education programs. Um, and especially in small towns where I feel like that coming out process can be delayed in a lot of ways, um, as particular small towns that are maybe not affirming or a lot more homogenous. Um, and so <laughs> like the, the act of being like an ally in to queer and trans people like starts before queer and trans people like um, realize or vocalize their experiences. Um, and so like we have to be able to like deconstruct these notions in our everyday interactions with people regardless if they are queer, trans or, or not because like the reality is that people are walking in these very fluid experiences. Um, no matter where they're at and their realizations with it. Yeah. Um, so I was asked to go ahead uh, and chime in and follow you, Brandon. Um, so from my perspective, having, you know, my, my work, my lane that I'm in, uh, deals with minoritized populations I and, and identify as part of the LGBT community. Um, I was not, um, I didn't grow up or train in the agriculture area, but what I would say is this, coming from the deep south uh, and spending my life in rural conservative areas, um, where the agriculture industry has a significant presence uh, and influence on the community has taught me a lot of things uh, about um, the, the ag industry. So um, in Western Kentucky, when, when I started doing LGBT work there, uh, I had, um, I've always approached this work from the standpoint of not shying away from the difficult conversations. And, um, you know, when, when I started this job here at Texas Tech, the first program I ever did was on religion. And everyone told me, don't touch it don't do it. You're going to get all kind of backlash. And what did I do? Well, I did it. 
Um, and so I approached uh, some assumptions I had about uh, ag uh, in Western Kentucky in a similar way. And um, the, the college there used to do this program. Uh, it was like Ag Day at the farm. Uh, the campus farm. Well, I I did gaze on the farm uh, and during our Pride Week, uh, and I was like, "Yep, I'm gonna load up a bunch of LGBT students, and we're going to the farm." And we did it, and the sky did not fall, um, and life went on, and it started to break down the awkwardness that had built up between folks who were not affiliated with Ag Ed and the LGBT uh, community to show that, that we can support each other. And then we begun to see LGBT Ag students come forward uh, and start asking for resources or experiences. So, you know, for me, I, I have never wanted to live and work in a major metropolitan area. It's just not for me. Um, and I shouldn't be made to because of my gender identity or my sexuality. Um, a place like Lubbock, Texas or Murray, Kentucky, those are my kind of places. Those are ag places. But there are also places where I think that small town feel, while sometimes can cause problems for LGBT or queer individuals, um, there's some positives and negatives. For me, that community has meant a great deal. Yes, everybody knows your business, but everyone, if you handle it the right way, can also uh, go on a learning journey with you. Uh, about the experience of being a trans woman, for example. Thanks so much, Jody, and everyone. Jody, I think I'm going to steal gaze on the farm, and that'll be the title of my memoir. Uh, so I appreciate you all so much sharing your personal experiences, and I reflect back on what you're saying, and the, the, there are so many great opportunities and moments and examples of allyship that you all talked about within that, whether it's hosting that event, bringing our LGBTQIA community out to the farm and, and making an environment that people feel welcome coming out or, you know, Colby, if there were folks intervening when you were having those issues with your principal, I mean, gosh, we see so many wonderful opportunities for ruptures of the status quo and for allyship. Um, and so now, panelists, I'm going to give us a kind time reminder that in this next question, Let's limit ourselves to a, a little bit shorter. Um, but let's talk a little bit about allyship. Um, so that way people can leave a little bit knowing what can you get started with tomorrow. So Matt, if you want to start us off, what do you hope for from an ally? Or when someone says that they're an ally, what kind of behaviors do you really expect to see from those people? Yes, and I would love to share. And if I start talking too much, feel free to just cut me off. Um, I think that one of the core tenets of allyship for uh, any minoritized population would be um, not seeing it as an identity, but rather seeing it as a practice. Allyship is a verb, and it's something that you have to do in order to uplift and support, um, in this case, the LGBT community. And I think that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in agriculture uh, with things like, um, for example, allyship trainings. Those are the things that I do in my role. Um, I give sessions um, on how you practice allyship, uh, whether it's just general or if we want to get specific and talk about um, like if it's for a department, I can sort of look at the curriculum, things that can be changed, things of that nature. Um, so it's more than just putting a sticker on your door that says proud ally. It's more than just saying, yes, I'm an ally. Um, I think that the first step, um, if this is new to you, would be to commit to that, committing to practicing uh, allyship. Um, now, that might look different for everyone because um, allyship is a process and there's really no endpoint. There's no such thing as the perfect ally. Um, and so it looks different for everyone. Um, so I'm thinking that folks who are new uh, to 
uh, maybe be new to allyship would be uh, seek out guidance um, because the last thing that um, folks want is for someone to say that they're an ally and do something that's wrong. Um, and so another important part on that is to decenter the conversation from yourself. Uh, do not treat allyship like charity work. It's something that you do to support and uplift people, of course, but it's not something that you do to make yourself feel good. It's a way for you to use your own privilege um, in order to foster those um, conversations that bring people to the table, fostering equity as opposed to just mere equality. Um, to me, I think that there are three groups. Um, and Kate, you sort of touched on how when we want to change the status quo, I think this is a really uh, important way of looking at it. So we have people who are pro-LGBT, there are people who are anti-LGBT, and then there are people in the middle who um, I just call apathetic. Um, and those apathetic people sort of can play into the anti-LGBT group because there's no progress that's taking place among them. Um, so in order for us to have that change in the status quo, for that needle to move, even though it's a slight movement, in order for that push to happen, there have to be more people saying, yes, I'm, I'm for this. I'm, it's not, oh, that's good. I accept them for that. It's I'm on board with this. Um, and so I think that's a very important thing to do in order for us to have that um, inclusion for LGBT people, for people of color, for people of um, disabled identities. Um, and yes, so it's more than just saying I'm an ally, but that's also a part of it too. So putting the sticker on your door, sure, that's good. That's, that's a form of visibility. It's saying, yes, I can have a conversation with you about this. Um, but yeah, it's both visibility, saying you're an ally, and also putting your money where your mouth is um, and demonstrating through actions. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And now, Brandon, I know that you have a lot of thoughts on allyship, uh, <laughs> which I think were your words directly. What would you add to what Matt's saying uh, about these kind of tensions between like signaling and making sure folks know that you're open as well as moving beyond this performative allyship to actually affecting systems change uh, when we really desperately need it? Yeah, thanks. I have so many thoughts on allyship. <laughs> Um, I think uh, based on what Matt's saying, I think like one of the important things um, that I see in AGA that's like really an important myth to dispel is this myth of gradualism, which is common in a lot of social equity arenas generally, I think, with different identities. Um, but what I mean by that is like particularly in rural conservative communities, which we've used this language and category to share about, we talk about like, I've heard so many people say like, we have to move slow, like not everybody's gonna be on board with it. Um, and so we have to like do little by little at the same time. But when we take that approach, it takes away the focus from marginalized people in those experiences and it centers privileges folks experiences instead. Um, and so that's not really true allyship. That's just like, instead of being in solidarity with marginalized people, you're kind of in that apathetic region in a, in a sense that um, Matt shared about, um, which can be just as harmful. Um, Martin Luther King has a great quote on the myth of gradualism um, from Letter from Birmingham Jail, which I won't go into, but if you're interested, you should look at that quote. And it applies specifically to race, but honestly can apply it across social identities um, in that sense. Um, and then another thing um, that I think about personally from my career experience um, and background is just how I use my marginalized experience to be in solidarity with um, other marginalized people. So as a queer person, what parts of my experience are similar to um, people who experience racism or um, ableism? And how can I use those experiences to create a pathway of understanding into solidarity with those people? Not to say that those experiences aren't the same because they're not, but how can I, you know, create more empathy with myself to be um, in solidarity with those people? And I think in AGED in particular, especially as the demographic um, is including a lot, is kind of transitioning towards a lot of like cis white women being in, um, specifically high school teacher roles, like how can cis white women use 
the experience of gender oppression um, to understand the experiences of queer people and also beyond that social identity too, um, to be in solidarity with those people. And then the last thing I will say to that, <laughs> um, specifically, uh, I think this really applies to Matt's point of allyship being a practice is um, there's also this myth that our workplaces and our schools are apolitical places. Um, like people have probably been seeing things like human rights are not political, but human rights are so political. Um, and the reality is that we need these political um, policies or whatever in order for human rights to be granted to people who are marginalized. Um, and so being in the, in the workplace and school and wherever, wherever we are, it's important to like actually stand in solidarity or be in solidarity, excuse me, with those, um, with those people and to confront, you know, that kind of apolitical apath apathy that um, Matt was talking about. I'll stop there, but I have so many thoughts on it. <laughs> Thanks so much for that and uh, truly excellent points uh, from everyone and I am even just thinking back to, you know, the debate last night, if any of you all watched that, and, you know, the conversations around the executive order around um, federal funding for things like diversity trainings, and even myself as a person who researches queer and trans people, I'm doing calculations of, does that affect the fellowship that I was thinking of applying for next year? How, what does this work look like in this political environment? So yeah, there, there's no way to have a workplace that is apolitical because I, I'm sitting there listening to that debate, thinking about how it is shaping every corner of my workplace every single day.